load over everybody. It's always quite a scary moment where you press go. But you're not sure what's going to come out of your head. But today, I'm back and I'm talking a little bit more about teachers, about us standing back, doing a little less of the hard work. Particularly today, I want to talk about trying to move the lesson from a teacher monologue to more of a dialogue, a, a conversation between yourself and your students. And that can happen at any age. It's obviously much easier with teenagers and with adults in particular, but can also start to put down those foundations of having dialogue between um, even younger students. So why is this important? Well, it's important because we want to know, uh, we want to encourage our students to make the learning that they are going, they are having, we want them to make it visible to us. Unless we can see the learning, visible learning as it's called, unless we can see that, we don't actually know that they're learning anything. They might just be copying, but actually they haven't got the understanding. So I'm going to be talking about that move and, and maybe making a few suggestions for how we can move from monologue over to dialogue. Because I think quite a lot of us are guilty, aren't we, of monologue. And we know that is general for teachers, you know, in whatever subject. 89, 80 to 90 percent of lessons research shows are shown are, um, are dominated by teacher talk so we want to redress that that balance to make sure that our students are actually learning and i just want to say a huge thank you to uh, a piano teacher who's fairly new to to teaching the piano who left a comment and some questions over on the youtube version of this video last week and i'm going to try and weave that in because her question was to do with a student who doesn't want to engage, who doesn't want to make the choices because they're seeking teacher approval all the time. So I think all that I'm going to say actually is relevant to that, but thank you for leaving that question. And if any of uh, any any other questions coming out from anybody else, just drop them in the, in the chat below. So I think the first really important thing to notice is that to have a, a, a dialogue the students have got to feel that they're in a safe and supportive environment. And to me, the best way of, of creating that is to do this, is to smile lots and to use humour whenever you can. So that there is a feeling that mistakes can be made absolutely safely and in fact are encouraged. You know, that mistakes are good. We learn from our mistakes. And you can model that by actually admitting to mistakes yourself. It's not a question of, oh, you can make mistakes, but I'll never do it. So you have to show that you make mistakes as well. And that, that's obviously very easy to do for all of us because we're all making mistakes and learning lots and lots from it. So create that environment where they feel safe to make the mistake. And you do that, I think, a lot of the time through laughter, through smiles and through humour and by actually um, sort of protecting the fact that now why don't you give this a go and uh, you, you will be making mistakes you might make three you might make four but actually what we're focusing on today is the rhythm and let's just focus on that and let's not worry about anything else that's absolutely fine so safe environment um, I think if you're wanting them to choose a piece of music um, maybe to go on and learn um, in the future then there's some really important guidelines. I feel that you need to choose, select the pieces really carefully. So just saying, would you like to do piece A or one, two or three from list A isn't really good enough. It's not what we're wanting. We want to select the concept or the skill that that student is going to learn. And we need to select the piece that best fits in that, that isn't too hard, that isn't too easy, but it is just right for that level of challenge the Goldilocks principle basically um, so choosing pieces is really important and getting the right level of challenge making that visible to the student why are we learning this piece make sure that they understand the concept of the skill that is behind your reason for choosing that piece and if you're going to give them two pieces to choose from then you need to really be explaining why and what each one will give them and make them two different styles of pieces, but they will learn the same concept no matter what. And I think the uh, another thing to think about of encouraging this student dialogue 
is to make sure that you engage from the very start in this idea of self-assessment, getting the students aware that they can assess their playing. So they play a short piece of music, let's say as a beginner, eight bars maybe. Um, have they got the right pitches? Have they got the right um, rhythms? Did they play with the steady beat? Did they use the right fingering? And you know, have so I have certainly have one student who, oh, that was dreadful, <laughs> she'll say. But she's learned over a period of four to five years that we have to break it down. Actually, it's not dreadful. She just got one bar wrong, or she got the fingering wrong in one bar. So she begins to understand how she can um, assess. I get to see her learning, and she knows what she has to work on next time. So they to get to get them to start to do that self assessment i use the se um, 7 out of 10 it, you know does it does it reach the 7 out of 10 level which to me is an acceptable level really i want them to be on 8 or 9 but they have to understand and we both do that assessment another thing i will do with my with my younger pupils in particular is i will get them to self assess and use magic number 3 now I have got some of my ducks here. Those of you that know me will know I love my ducks. And these are my practice buddies. And um, every time a student plays a phrase correctly with the right note, the right rhythm, the right fingering, yeah, the right pitches, it depends. The, I might choose one of those. Can you play that with the right rhythm? Every time they get the rhythm right, the, um, the ducks move over to the other side of the piano. Yeah. Um, if they get the notes wrong and we're only assessing rhythm, that's fine. I, it'll still go over. We want them to get the right rhythm on that particular um, piece of music. So practice buddies. And of course, you know, they're fun. They're humorous. They make us laugh. They make us smile. So we accept the fact that we can make mistakes and it's absolutely fine. Um, okay, so the other couple of points I want to say are about questions. I talked about questions last week, actually about um, asking more than yes or no questions. So I've, I've written down a couple of questions for me to ask this afternoon for my students. And I like to put mine on post-it notes and I will put that on my piano because then that reminds me to ask these questions or to have them in my mind. So two different levels of students here. Um, for the, the older students, I'm going to ask the question, what if, what if you play bar one with your right hand, bar two with your left hand, bar three with your right hand, and bar four with your left hand? Yeah. So they are immediately slightly cognitively challenged, but they can play the music already, so not too much, but it will just get them out of feeling safe and secure with it and make it a little bit more exciting. And then for a younger student, what I might say, oh, that was easy, wasn't it? So what if... You sit down for bar one, but you stand up for bar two. Sit down for bar three. Stand up for bar four. So again, there's a bit of humour there. There's a bit of silliness. It'll make them giggle. Then you have to go a little bit further and say, now, how was that? What happened when you did that? And this is where you get into their learning. They then reflect back to you. And probably they'll be so busy giggling that... You know, they they they, uh, they will happily come out with a response because you've used that humour to help them. So get that post-it note out, see if you can come up with some silly things to do in the lessons or and then follow it up with a question about, well, how was that? What happened there? Getting them to reflect on what they've learnt. Last thing, last thing, and that is to give them space. Now, uh, by that, I mean time. Give them time to answer. You don't dive in immediately with an answer because two seconds of silence have gone by. Just maybe find something else you can do <laughs> for another few seconds. Another suggestion is to give them space physically. We spend a lot of our time sitting by our student side by side. And that can feel really quite, oh, there is a pressure here to so stand up. Leave them with a question. I'm just going to give you that question for a moment. I'm just going to go over and do something here. I just need to write, yeah, find an excuse to move away and see if they can come up with an answer or, um, you know, give them that opportunity to think through and process stuff. 
So I've been going on quite a bit today and um, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you'll find that useful. Some ideas really in there for how to move your lessons from you doing all the talking and all the working. Yes, lazy piano teacher. Step back, start to ask really meaningful questions, use humour, use smiles to create a really warm, um, safe environment for your students. Um, make sure that you, when you're choosing pieces, you give them really, really small options and um, help them to move towards a point where they are beginning to assess themselves. It takes time, though, all this. You can't just rush into it. It takes several years, really, of building to get your students used to thinking in this way. And then, of course, when you get new students in, you have to get working with them as well. But they'll get on to it. They will do it if you are persistent and consistent. So thank you so much for watching and any other questions do just let me know either here on Facebook or over on YouTube. Bye bye for now.